In this video, we're going to be talking about intervals. And in particular, intervals as they occur in the major scale. So I've got almost two octaves of the major scale up with the half steps labeled. And I hope, by the way, that very soon, if not already, you're at a place where those half step labels really aren't necessary. You just look at that and you know where the half steps are. Before we can talk about intervals, in order to make sense of the names we're going to give them, I need to give you some categories for intervals that have kind of an old history within music. We've already talked about the octave and the special way that two notes that, are, that an octave apart fit together. There's kind of a ring there. They, they really fit together evenly. Now, there's a similar kind of a ring with this. The best way to demo this actually would be in a beautiful stone room with singers who could sing this perfectly in tune. There would be this amazing sense of the richness. So it's, it's richer than an octave. The octave is a little bit more neutral because they fit together so well. And yet those notes really fit together well. They harmonize, they ring. They reinforce each other. Similarly, similar kind of ring out of this interval. Now in earlier phases of Western music history, the stability, that sense of stability and ring that you got out of those intervals led to them being the goals, the main goals of musical motion. Any music, almost any music, is going to make some use of relative stability and relative instability to lead you through some kind of musical drama. Uh, now, we're going to talk about these intervals that have that kind of ring. First of all is consonances, which come from the Latin prefix con, together, sonare, sounding together. They sound together well. They fit together well. They are consonant intervals. Now, the intervals that have that kind of ring are going to be called perfect consonants. Now, this term is important to, to be clear on. Why do we call this perfect? These days, the word perfect has evolved in such a way that it basically means lacking flaw. These shouldn't be thought of as consonances that lack flaws. There's an older sense of the word perfect, which means having reached its intended goal or complete. So these are complete consonances. They are consonances that have reached their goals. The, the, the music has reached a good stopping point. So for example, in some styles of music, uh, a, a stretch of music might lead to something like this. And when we get there to that perfect consonance at the end, I'll play that again. We know that we've reached our goal. We've reached perfection, not in the sense of being without flaw, but in the sense of being complete. Now, there are other kinds of consonances such as this. Those notes also sound together well. They fit together well. Uh, and yet they don't have that same sense of ring. They don't have that same sense of stability. We call these imperfect consonances. Again, not because there's anything wrong with them, but especially because in an earlier style of music, these were consonances that hadn't yet reached their intended goal. Finally, we have what are called dissonances. Now, a dissonance is an interval that, or so we say, does not sound together well. What do we mean by that? We mean that there's a certain kind of, or especially, there's a harshness. There's a sense that the notes are, they're fighting it out in some sense. There's an instability. Now, dissonance, this isn't to say it's ugly. Dissonance can be tremendously beautiful. It can be used, and if there were no dissonance, music would be pretty boring, unless composers were really, really creative with other things. So there's nothing wrong with dissonance, but dissonance has this sense that in some ways there's, there's sorry, uh, there's, con there's a sense of conflict between these notes. Now, interestingly enough, even though so much of what happens in Western music is culturally rooted, it grew out of a certain historical development, 
Uh, at the same time, there is something rooted in psychoacoustics in the basics of how primates actually hear uh, typical patterns of vibrations and sound that leads to that being heard as more unstable than that. And that's one of the things that hopefully we'll have time to touch on in class. Uh, but these names are important, perfect, imperfect dissonances. These categories of interval are important for understanding the names that we're going to give to interval. So first of all, the simple, and we're gonna just talk through these in order from smallest to largest. And at this point, it'll, I won't display it on, uh, on full screen, but this handout that you can download on all of the intervals and their sizes, I suggest that you download this, print out a copy, open it in a separate screen, what have you, so you can refer to this at the same time that you're listening to this presentation. That'll just help you out a little bit. And if you wanna pause the video for a sec to go find this, I recommend that you do that. So, our most basic intervals are those intervals that exist between notes in the major scale. The simplest one is called the unison. This kind of makes sense, it's, and it's given the number one. Uh, it's the number, you know, unison is in unity, it's the same thing. So, a C4 and another C4. A unison. Now, a, more specifically, a perfect unison, because a unison, again, has that kind of simple fitting together that an octave does, even more so. So a perfect unison. A unison is a perfect consonance. As we get a little bit bigger, so that's the smallest interval we could possibly have, zero half steps, and this is what we're going to be named. doing in this chart. We name every interval, and each name has two parts. It has a unison, second, third, fourth, fifth, based on how many steps along the scale, it also has a quality because you have different sizes of fifth, different sizes of third, uh, and there will be quality words that we're using. Each, it also has an abbreviation, so perfect unison is abbreviated P1, and there's a number of half steps, so that's what we're gonna be working through. Now as we get a little bit larger, the, notes that have, the interval that has one half step is of course the half step, also known, and it occurs right here in the scale, also known as a minor second. Why? Because any time we count intervals, we're gonna start on the first note of the interval, and we're gonna to go to the second. One, two, it's a second. One, two, it's a second. And certain intervals uh, can be perfect. Other intervals cannot be perfect. So a, a unison is a kind of interval that can be perfect. A second is never perfect. There is no such thing as a perfect second. And any interval that cannot be perfect comes in two main species called major and minor, simply using the, sorry, that's not visible. Let me do that again. Two main species. So if it's perfect, it's perfect. Otherwise, major and minor from the Latin words for large and small. So the second, as you go from one step to another, that's going to be called a second, one, two. The small one is the half step, one, one half step containing. The larger one, one, two, one, two. Most of them, really, one, two. Most of the seconds are major seconds. They're whole steps, they contain two half steps. Now, any kind of a third, one, two, three. Any kind of a third is always going to have two steps in it. Some of the time, and some of the time, one of those steps will be one of the half steps. And in fact, that's a little bit more prevalent. So if one of those steps is a half step, for example, if I'm going from here to here, so one, two, three, that's some kind of a third. I can, it contains one half step. So the whole step contains two half steps. So that's a total now of three half steps. That's the smaller kind of a third because one of the steps is a half step. It's a minor third, it contains three half steps. It's abbreviated, like so, M3. Now if, like me, you have terrible handwriting, you may find it helpful to draw a line above that lowercase m, especially if you have loopy handwriting. And those two things, those two m's, may not look all that different. And if you just add a line above the, above the lowercase one for minor third, major third, 
that'll make it much easier to tell what you're talking about. So the minor third with three half steps, the major third, for example, right here. Those are both whole steps, so four semitones total. There's no half step among the steps included in the third. That's a major, that's a major third. 